Okay, it is time now to welcome a first guest this evening who hails from Clino, County Tyrone. And earlier this month made history when she was elected to the top job in the reformed Stormont Executive, the first nationalist politician to ever hold the role here, to look back on her first two weeks in the job and to look forward to a new political chapter on this island. Would you please welcome the First Minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Two weeks in. Two weeks in. You said it was a big day for the parish. Does it still <laughs> feel like a big day for the parish? It certainly has. It's been a bit of a whirlwind for the past two weeks. Very busy, but very good, very positive. The feedback out there, the hope that people feel again. I just think it's been an immense uh, journey for the last two weeks. Uh, big day for uh, a lot of people. I'm assuming a big day for your family as well. Oh, of course, everybody's very proud. I'm proud. You know, it's just... Uh, such a big moment in the history of our island. And yeah, my, my family are proud. They know how hard I work. So, you know, they're very pleased to see all of that. But I was mostly struck this week by um, a lot of the film crews going into where I'm from, a rural village, Clonow in County Tyrone. And people asking, what's Michelle O'Neill like? You know, they want to know who's the person behind First Minister. And did they tell the truth? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all paid off accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was all, you know, I'm still live where, where, I, where I was reared, um, so very much part of the community that I live in. But I was so proud of them all just to say, well, she's just Michelle, she's just our, our neighbour, our friend. Um, but yeah, it's been a really, really um, fabulous journey. And I'm sure uh, your mum must have been proud because I know she helped you out uh, a lot whenever you were a young mum yourself. Yes, so I had uh, my first child when I was 16. Uh, and mummy was just amazing. Mummy and daddy both, my whole family circle were absolutely amazing and still are today. Sadly, Daddy's no longer um, with us, but uh, way back then, you know, I was still going through school uh, and Mummy quit work so she could stay at home, so she could mind Sears just so I could go out to work or go back to school and get my education. So, you know, she's just been that centrepiece of our family and just been such a strong role model for me and for my children um, growing up. So, yeah, you could never thank her enough for just the sacrifices that she made so that her child could achieve. And, um, yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, you're a granny now yourself, so I'm assuming was it the whole clan got together to celebrate? Yes, so I was in Stormont doing interviews um, after I did the big speech. Um, and when I landed back to my house then, they were all waiting for me to come home to do the wee bit of celebration, because that's important too. Um, but yeah, it, was, it, it just was great. I mean, I am a granny now myself. You know, everything that I try to achieve in my political life is what I want for grandchildren, what I want for, you know, for everybody's children. Just hope that opportunity, you know, that's something better than perhaps the world that we grew into, uh, we came into. So I just think that that's what it's all about. It's about we, Stevie, it's about the future. It's about, you know, what's ahead of us in terms of the, the journey that we'll all travel on together. When we're traveling on that journey, what does it mean to you personally to be the first nationalist, first minister in Northern Ireland? I, I'm so proud. I am really, really proud. And uh, I didn't give up because of course the election that I won, that I fought was almost two years ago. Um, but I didn't give up on the, on the chance that we'd eventually get to the point that we got to two weeks ago. Uh, I'm so glad that we are now there. I also know that that comes with enormous responsibility. Um, but I'm up for that. You know, I just think that this is a, an amazing time to be a political leader, particularly in the journey that we've come through in the North. And I just think that uh, we have so much to do and so much we can do together. So to have that opportunity to actually have people's backs, to try to work hard for people every day on the bread and butter issues, the things that people worry about and keeps them awake at night. I want to do my very, very best for those people. So proud, but also I take the responsibility very seriously and I want to do my best. You're talking there about working together. Uh, Deputy First Minister, Emma Little Pingali. Um, how have you guys been getting on? Uh, I saw you we was on the Shankill Road there. We were indeed. That was another, another first. Um, yeah, Emma and I have got on great. I think we've had a very positive first um, two weeks. You know, we're both, ta both tasked with leadership, um, given that responsibility to lead, and we're determined to do that together. You know, we hold a joint office. Uh, we want to work together. We have come from two very different uh, political backgrounds, two different lived experiences, two different outlooks for where we think we should be in the future, and particularly in relation to constitutional change. But that's all right, isn't it? 
it's fine to have that different viewpoint, but also working towards uh, day to day things like public services, health, education, childcare. And this week was a great opportunity for us because we both pri prioritised um, childcare. And we went into a childcare setting in North Belfast, and we also went into a childcare setting on the Shankill Road. And I believe that's the first time that a First Minister and a Deputy First Minister has ever stood on the Shankill Road side by side visiting a project. And I was again, you know, pleased that we were able to do that. But I don't think Emma or I looked at the children in North Belfast or the children in, in the Shankill and, and East Belfast and thought for a second that um, they were different. They're children. And everything that we're doing is about building that better future for them. Um, so I just thought that that was a fabulous thing for us to do early on. Emma's dad was in the Ulster Resistance and your dad was in the IRA. Does it help that you guys both understand the reality of the past whenever you're trying to build that future you're talking about? Yeah, I think that's so important just given our complicated and complex history and so much hurt and pain and that was felt by everybody. And I think that uh, Emma and I are very lucky to be the Good Friday Agreement generation that are two people that are now tasked with trying to bring people together to be unifiers and to lead by example and to accept that our difference is there, to accept that we come from different backgrounds and to accept that we have different outlooks. But that is all right. I think that's the epitome of just the North. I think if we can get to the point where we're respectful of each other's journey, then there isn't anything that we can't do in terms of that understanding and then looking towards the future. How much of that stuff do you talk about? I know you were down at John Bruton's funeral, you're in a car together and the cameras aren't there. I mean, is it family stuff? Is it family history? What do you... Chat yeah, so, about. so we're a similar age, um, although she'd probably want me to point out that I am a little bit older, um, just for the record. <laughs> um, I actually thought you were looking at me there and saying we're a similar age. I was going, no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think we have that in common and, and just I think the enormity of the challenge that we have, because there's no doubt that we've had a good first number of weeks in trying to bed things in. But we now are tasked with leading uh, what is a very special and unique circumstance with four parties around an executive table. We have to lead and navigate our way through that. So no doubt there's going to be many nettles to grasp, many challenges ahead of us. But, you know, if we have that open communication, if we understand where we're coming from, then I think that we can actually do really good things together. You've said that you want to be First Minister for all. Um, I know that Arlene Foster went to an Ulster final in Clonus. You were at a PSNI graduation this week. Is there anything that you wouldn't go to? No, I have a very open mind and I would gladly receive invitations to anything that anybody wants to send me one for. Um, but I just think it's important that we all step outside of our traditional comfort zones and find ways to reach um, others out there. I mean, I, I'm a Republican. I'm very comfortable in my own skin. I know who I am and what I want to achieve. But I also think that if we're going to lead and be political leaders in today's society, 26 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, then we all have to be focused on the future. And I do think things like uh, that are very important symbolically for particularly those from the British tradition, that if, for example, myself attending the Queen's uh, funeral or King Charles' coronation, that's really, really important if I'm going to represent everybody in society. And I believe that I can fairly represent everybody in society. And I want to demonstrate that, not just by saying it, but by doing things that actually uh, really mean something to people. You know, you're talking there... Um... <laughs> You know, we both know how it works uh, up the road. You know, uh, you attend something that makes somebody happy and mm. then there's somebody else who gets offended. Um, will you still be attending IRA commemorations now you're First Minister? I just think that, and, you know, we know this, um, we have a very tragic past, a very difficult past where so much hurt and injury has been caused, many injustices out there. And I think we have to respect that everybody has a right to remember their dead. And we should just be respectful of that and, and create that space for each other. Clearly, I am First Minister for everybody now. Um, I will be very through to that pledge that I've made. So any invitations that I would take up would always be very mindful of the office that I hold because I want to represent everybody fairly. And that includes Republicans because I think that's important to say also. Um, I want to represent the community that I come from, uh, the background that I come from, but I can also do that and also represent everybody else there in society. I, I think that that's admirable and I think you can try. Um, but, you know, there is that thing where by attending an IRA commemoration, maybe some of the people that you want to reach out to, I mean, they, they are going to be offended by that, aren't they? 
I know, but remember behind um, every loss of life throughout the conflict, and I regret every single loss of life, I'm sorry that people were born into a place that conflict was the name of the day. I'm sorry that people felt that there was no alternative. I'm sorry that you and I were born into a situation where war was all around us every day. But we have to respect that we all come from different perspectives and we all have different narratives and actually different lived experiences. Um, and I'm very mindful of trying to create the space where we can all be true to who we are, don't surrender who we are, but also let's create the space to be respectful of each other. I will work night and day to represent everybody fairly in our society. I won't surrender who I am, but I certainly will will reach out and I will stretch myself continually to try to find ways to reach people who perhaps haven't felt that they know me or that I can represent them in the past, but I will demonstrate that every day. Because that is important. It's, um... <laughs> you know, it's... It is important that, you know, you are going out there and saying who you are to start with before you're trying to make that bridge. Because I think you have to be authentic. You know, I think if you're not authentic, why would anybody believe that what you're saying is, is actually what you're trying to achieve? So mm. um, it's cards on the table, it's who you are, you know, and let's then be honest about what we're trying to, to do here together. And let's build a better future. I mean, last year we celebrated 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement. And the society that I was born into and you were born into is completely changed for the better, a more fair, a more equal society. But when I look towards the future, I'm thinking about my grandchildren. I'm thinking about what the world looks like for them. I'm thinking about how do we ensure that they can fulfil their whole potential and not have to live with you know, the, the experience that so many of us have come through in the past. You're talking about the past there. Um... <laughs> You're talking about the past and, you know, you mentioned no alternative. You know, a couple of years ago, you said that pre-Good Friday Agreement, there was no alternative to the conflict. Do you, do you still believe that? Well, I think that the alternative was the Good Friday Agreement. It was peace. And I'm so glad that we uh, arrived at that position. I'm so glad for all those people. I'm so grateful, actually, but, but, to all but, of those people who actually put themselves forward, mm. actually secured the peace and made sure that we all live in a more prosperous and better society today, a more peaceful um, society today. But I do believe that the Good Friday Agreement um, brought a juncture that we are all should be, you know, hold dear and know how hard fought it was to actually get to that point. But, but, but could there have been another way, you know, before that? Because I know there's a lot of families and, you know, mine included, who um, you think a lot of people die for nothing. Yeah, I think, I think that your family and many, many other families out there, you know, the hurt and the pain, it doesn't matter how you were hurt or who hurt who. I think what does matter is that all pain is the same and we have to absolutely respect that and understand it. And even better than that, let's make sure that those circumstances never, ever arise again. Let's make sure that we build a, a better society. And also, let's find ways to try to allow people to heal. And I think that's why it's important whenever I say things like, I regret every... Um, loss of life throughout the conflict and that's without exception that's not for some that's for all and I think if we're going to do that that's how we can start to move forward because I've never asked anybody to move on the past is the past it is our collective and shared past but I certainly would ask people to try to move forward and I want to help to try to move our society and our people forward in a unified way So Mary Lou, Mary Lou MacDonald, says that a United Ireland is within touch and distance. Geoffrey Donaldson thinks she's got the longest arms in Ireland. <laughs> uh, who's right? Uh, how close is touch and distance in your opinion? Well, of course, Mary Lou's right. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it is. I do think that uh, we're in a decade of opportunity. And I think that... The when, you, when you say a decade of opportunity... Do you think touch and distance is yeah, 10 so, years? Yes, I do. I believe that we're in this decade of opportunity and a decade of change. And I think that, um, you know, I don't think anybody's sitting today thinking it's going to be tomorrow, constitutional change is going to come tomorrow. But the prudent thing to do now is to plan. We should be planning for what does that look like. We should be having the conversation, a mature conversation, about what does constitution change look like for us all. What does the education system look like? What does the health service look like? And create these opportunities for us all not just those people who are already convinced of the merits of unity, but also, I think, those people who are yet to be convinced. Let's and, and there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if you look at the polls, you know, like United Ireland up north, because obviously it can't happen unless the majority of people in Northern Ireland vote for it to start with, and mm -hmm. it's sort of it's about 30, 35%. Um, 
how are you going to start that conversation? Because if you're the person who's going to try to convince someone else, you have to start it. How are you going to convince unionists that, that their future is in a new Ireland? So I think that um, my election as First Minister speaks to change. I mean, that's the epitome of change, I think. Um, and I think that whenever we look at all around us, I, you know this now, there's a conversation about constitutional change now that was never there before. People are exploring it. People are entering into the conversation. And, and I think that's becoming a wider, wider circle of conversation. We need to encourage but that. But the numbers I, aren't really changing, though. But again, I think until you focus people's minds, um, at this moment, minute, it's like a, you know, a question that sits out there. But if we're actually in the space where it's actually something that's real and live play, and we're actually having the conversation around what it looks like, what's the better? Because it has to be better. Better for everybody, not just those of an Irish identity, but those of a British identity. How do we crack this and actually, once and for all, have an arrangement that actually works for us all? That's what I want to achieve, and I think we can, if we have the maturity and the confidence in our, our own beliefs and where we come from and how we want to articulate all of that. But if we have create that space, then we, I think that we can have this in the next decade. So if we're in that direction to travel, and you and I both know that north of the border, life's about compromise. How much compromise are people in the south going to have to make to welcome unionists and a British identity into a potential New Ireland? Well, I think isn't life in general about compromise, not just in the north? I mean, I think that, that that's just a reality. But I think that these are... But, this but, is but why people, people in the north have had to compromise to keep people alive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're down here and you are looking at what that future is, you can, you can decide that's for me or that's not for me. I mean, how much change do you think is going to have to happen here? Well, in terms of what the change looks like, I think that's the conversation that we need to have. So that's why we would say that now is the time for the Irish government to plan and to actually create the space, because there's an imperative on the Irish government to create that space and actually create the forum in which we all can go in. But I think we should talk about, start with the conversation around, what does the economy look like? You know, what does people's standard of living look like? What does our health service look like? What does the education system look like? Let's have those big conversations because those are the things that actually we all worry about and we all think about and we think, when we think about what's good for our families. And I think if we could have a, a, a forum in which we can have those conversations, then I think more and more people will be convinced. And the other big factor I think that will convince a lot of people in terms of constitution change is the fact that we've been dragged out of Europe in the north, we've been dragged out of Europe against our wishes. We voted to remain, but yet and all, we've been taken out. And Europe have now said in the, in the event of a successful unity referendum, then we automatically rejoin. So for a lot of people, I think going forward, particularly those people who don't have that traditional outlook of wanting to see constitutional change, um, I think the big question will be, which union do they wish to be part of? And I think that'll be a big factor in terms of how people decide to vote whenever we do actually get to the point where we have the referendum. Sinn Féin here in the South, uh, recently the polls have taken a bit of a dip. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, we have to listen to people. Uh, we have to really take on board what, what people are telling us and we have to work hard then to win that support back. I mean, we've been very high in the polls since the last um, general election. We've been leading in the polls since the last general election. And, but we'll go out and we'll engage with people and we'll take on board what's being said and we'll try to, to rectify that. But I do think this... I think that... Um, Change isn't just something that's happening in the North. So my coming into post as First Minister is, you know, it speaks to that change, as I said. But I think the change that's available to people here is immense. The change could be a Sinn Féin-led government here in the state. The change could be the first female Taoiseach in Mary Lou Macdonald. And I think that that's all for people, all within their grasp in, the, in, know, the, all, in the months ahead. You know, all, all of that is... Um you know, from, from your point of view, something to look forward to. But if you look at the now and you look at some of those issues that you're talking about, I mean, do you think Sinn Féin has been clear enough on maybe their position like housing for refugees and asylum seekers? Look, as, as I said, I think that we have to take on board what, what the polls say and we'll, over time, we'll work that out. The best way we'll work it out is actually going out and talking to people, which we are. We're engaging with people, we're so, going so door what, to door. So what is the position though on that? No, but that's what I'm saying. I think that we need to listen to people. I don't think we can put it down to one issue or another. I think we have to genuinely engage with people and that's what we're doing. There's many electoral contests to be uh, had in the, in the year ahead. The local government, the European and at all election. 
Um, and people will have an opportunity then at that stage to, to vote for change. And Sinn Féin want to, our number one priority in government will be to build housing. And we want to do this for the people because for far too long they have not had what we need. And we know we have a housing crisis. So the opportunity for change, I think, um, we will put it to the electorate. We take nothing for granted. We know we have to work hard at it, but we will work hard at it and we'll demonstrate every day that we can deliver that change that people want. Um, when you and I were growing up, uh, we were well used to seeing riots. How does it make you feel when you see riots on the streets of Dublin about some of the issues that are... Look, it's horrible. It's so, so sad um, to see that on the streets of Dublin or to see it anywhere. Um, riots should not be uh, where anybody is and I think we're all horrified whenever we witness those scenes and for the people that were hurt uh, on that very day as well. So uh, let's make that a thing of the past. Um, I think we're all committed to ensuring that. Are you going to Washington for Paddy's Day? I am. The SDLP aren't going. Um, you and Sinn Féin's position on Gaza is pretty clear. You have said in the past that um, you feel that what's going on there is genocide, that Israel shouldn't really be supported by anyone. America's their biggest supporter. Would it not be more of a statement if you decided not to go this year? No, the US have always been a very strong partner for peace, actually a critical player in terms of achieving our own peace process. And I would hope that the US would use that same uh, pragmatism and the same approach they took to our peace process to bring that message to the Middle East. So we will be in the States in, over the St. Patrick's Week, as will the Taoiseach, as will the Irish government. And Ireland, who's been so strong in terms of the plight of the Palestinian people, I would hope that the Taoiseach actually takes the opportunity to put the message loud and clear to the US administration that peace, dialogue, immediately is what's required. What we're all witnessing in Palestine at this moment in time is absolutely horrendous, it's heartbreaking, it's genocide, and it needs to stop. And I will take every plat plat platform pat to go out and raise my voice and use my voice. Because if we apply the logic of not dialoguing, of not talking to people, we never would have had a peace process in the North. Before I let you go, a uh, couple of questions. Do you think there'll ever be another Unionist First Minister in Northern Ireland? Well, I'm going to work to ensure that, uh, that, that I am staying in this post for as long as I personally can. <laughs> not, not, not because, not for anything other than... I believe I am the Good Friday Agreement. I know I'm the Good Friday Agreement generation. I know that I can do, and I believe I can do great things in this role. I want my legacy to be what's good for every child out there. I want to build a better and a more positive future. I want prosperity and hope to be what people wake up in the morning and think about. So I have work to do, and I'm going to give it my all and for as long as the people elect me to do so. And one final question for you. Do you think you'll be the last First Minister in Northern Ireland? <laughs> well, someone's enjoying that. <laughs> Un unionist, unionist sin tonight? There we go. <laughs> Look, I, I believe, I've, I've been asked this question a lot in the last um, two weeks about, you know, uh, talking about constitutional change and, you know, having the executive up and running. I believe we can do both. I believe that we can have good power share and solid power share and dealing with the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues whilst advocating for constitutional change. And who knows where this journey is going to take us in the next 10 years. But let's come at it with a good heart. Let's meet each other halfway. And let's have the maturity and the pragmatism to be comfortable enough to have the conversations, even sometimes whenever they're difficult. Uh, thanks for coming and having the conversation with me tonight, Michelle. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle and yeah. OK. Now...